and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Well, welcome everyone to the show, to a Reverend Faith and Current Affairs. I'm really pleased to be joined once again after some time by uh, Laura Dosworth. Laura, it's great to be with you. Thank you very much for coming back on the show. Well, it's lovely. It's like coming coming to see a friend in their living room, coming back to the Reverend podcast. Is this, uh, this might be my third visit, maybe yeah. my fourth even. Yeah, yeah, well, we haven't had you on, Laura, because, you know, you, you, you haven't produced a book for, it must be at least, <laughs> it must be at least two years now. Yeah, 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 just it's just over two years. I like I like a kind of a two year interval between books. I'm pretty pacey with books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's not bad, really. I mean, if anyone who's actually written a book, as I have, Laura, which I never mention, by the way, I just never just never mention it. Um, okay, I have, I well, have we need to address that today. We need yeah, to address that today. I, I have turn the tables on you, and as I know nothing about it, that will be a good little yeah, reverse yeah. interview. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm extremely reluctant to talk about it because I'm very modest. But um, yeah, no, I did write a book. But it, it it what the point I'm making is it takes a while, doesn't it? You know, you have to um, you have to go through all these processes which no one sees. You know, negotiating with your with your uh, you know whoever's going to publish it. You know, writing an outline, blah blah blah, all that kind of stuff. And then you actually have to go in and produce the thing, and it takes a while. And people just people don't appreciate it. So two two years is pretty good because your last one was. Um, your last one was a labour of love, wasn't it? A state of fear. I mean, that was that was absolutely huge. I think um, every book I've written is a labour of love. I just don't know why you would do it otherwise. I mean, there are authors who I probably consciously go about producing commercially successful books. Yeah, that's a jolly good idea. I mean, maybe I should do that next time. But the yeah, thing I was is, going to say, money not... money is a good motivation for some people. Yeah. I mean, not not for well, us. That... I, well, I don't know. I wouldn't mind being rich. But the thing is, um, because being an author is very uncertain yes. and it is not financially rewarding, mm. every book for me is kind of pulled out of my guts and it does feel like it's a service and it's it's done with love. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So, yeah, yes, it's an act of love to write a book. And, you know, love affairs are quite deep and involving and and messy. Yeah, yeah. That's good. You could probably ext extend that metaphor as well, I suppose. But um, <laughs> no, I don't know. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't venture. Let's see what happens. happens. Let's see what happens yeah, during yeah. our chat if it gets extended. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, the state of fear was, I know we, we want to talk about your new book, Free Your Mind, which I have here. I have an advanced copy. I was going to hold it up just to be clear to people. No, you've it's still got that. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Here we go. I can do better. In case anyone's yeah. watching the video, this is what it looks like. Yeah. Jamie, do you not have the real book yet? We've got to address that. I'd love to have the real book. I mean, look, I've read this. I've read the whole thing, yeah. as I do. Okay. I, always, I always read things. If, you know, if people are on the podcast, I'll read the book. And I've read the book from start to finish, and I, I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. But I have only got a plastic copy with, um, you know, it's bound together by... Um, by the publishers okay. well yeah. you see you're one of the you're one of the people that got that early advanced copy so that you could be prepared for an interview but of course by now we've got the real printed book which yeah. is just look it's, it's a lot nicer to read that isn't Beautiful. it than a printed yeah. pdf so um i will ask harper collins to send you a finished book um so you've got it on your bookshelf and in your in your library in your house um, i'd love that you've already read it yeah, I'd love to have a. I'd love to have a um, a a nice. Um, it's presumably a hardback copy. I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous, but you're going to send me a hardback copy, and I'll put it right next to. Yeah, lovely. I'll, I'll put it right next to a state of fear on my bookshelf, which is just there behind the sign. I've got it behind the sign. Um, yeah, no, that'd be really nice. Thank, thank you, Laura. I love the. I love the cover with all the fish. Uh, so it's it's you know for people who didn't see it who are just listening it is it's like a square of sort of goldfish isn't it and then one of the fish is actually peeling off and going in the other direction um which is really nice and i don't know whether you, did you did you have the idea for that laura did someone do you have like you presumably there's like a team in the, the publishing company you know because i yeah. know because I, I know about you know writing books but the, in the publishing company there, there's an artist there's like a graphic designer or something takes the but it's it's interesting because um there's this there's this TV show uh, called The Chosen, which is about Christ and his disciples, which is a kind of imaginative retelling. And they've got a credit sequence where um in a sort of cartoon form, the same sort of thing happens. There's like the these fish swimming along, and then one of them peels off and goes off in the other direction, and then several others do as well, which is kind of um I don't know, you're it just it just reminds me of it. It's a nice image, it's nice. 
Oh, that's nice. Well, there's a there's a bit of a story about the front cover, I guess. Um, things if people aren't familiar with book publishing, they won't know how it works. Yeah, As exactly. the author, you can have varying degrees of control over mm. what a front cover looks like. So with my last publisher, there was an independent called Pinter and Martin. And I'm very grateful to them because they published four pretty brave books with me, you know, mm. breasts, penises, vulvas, and the government weaponizing fear. So all brave in different ways. Yeah. And um, I absolutely adored their cover designer. I love how all of my books looked with Pinter and Martin. And I had quite a lot of influence over what the front cover would look like. So the publisher would brief the designer and put me directly in touch with him. So, you know, I, I could talk to the book designer. Mm. Um, and then when you work with a bigger publisher, you have a much smaller degree of control. I mean, obviously, as a team, everybody wants to be happy with the finished results. So you're involved, but you wouldn't have the final say as such. Mm. And actually, Patrick and I weren't sure about the goldfish. Now, I've grown to love the goldfish. (laughs) I now really like the front cover, but I wasn't sure. And possibly Patrick and I were overthinking it a little bit. I think it was, it looked good, it looked neat. And you've got the one fish that's thinking independently and swimming away from the shoal. Mm. which emblemizes the group think and the social conformity of humans and then the person who chooses to free their mind so the mm. link's obvious yeah. but we were we were like oh hang on a minute it doesn't matter how fast and hard that goldfish swims that was going to be in the goldfish bowl mm. and yeah. so we worried it wasn't quite the right animal but we i think we were probably investing a bit too much um interpretation in, in the cover the main yeah. thing is it's got to look nice and stand out as a thumbnail on amazon to be honest jamie that is yeah. what it's all about these days they want a yeah. thumbnail to look arresting you could you could certainly overthink it can't you and and i think the other thing that i'd say about it not a critical thing it's just a question but does it sort of imply that the majority of people will will always be sort of you know trapped in the group think and it's it's only a, a very small minority who kind of peel off and go in the other direction I don't think so. That's not the interpretation I would take from the book. I would spin it around a different way, actually. And I mean, I've got to say, it could be worse. You know, we could have had sheep on the front cover. There was a a Levi's ad years ago that um, showed a flock of white sheep and one was a black sheep moving away from the others to show that, you know, that the rebel's different. You you could have gone for something a little bit more obvious and unpleasant Mm. like sheep on the front cover. (laughs) Um, No, the thing is, if you feel that you're surrounded by groupthink, if you feel that unpleasant sense of manipulation and artificiality in the message if you feel the net tightening the fact is well the position I've come to over the last several years is you can't fix all the other goldfish Mm. first of all you have to start with yourself you always have to start with freeing your own mind with self-individuating with making yourself strong and resilient if you were on an airplane and there was a crash you'd be told to put your own oxygen mask on first Mm. so it's a bit like that that goldfish swimming away right that's the first one i bet Mm. you another goldfish on the square is just about to join him he's going to think oh hang on where's that little fish going that's interesting he's going to turn around and follow and then another fish will and in fact there's a theory of this in conformity um cass sandstein who's one of the architects of nudge he he wrote the book nudge Mm. um He wrote another book called Conformity, and he says that there are cascades of conformity. So conformity kind of goes in a wave. You can feel it. Think about the emojis that take over social media. First, it's a mask emoji. Then it's a Ukraine emoji. Then in Pride season, it's a rainbow emoji. You know, you see these movements sweep through social media. So that would be one example of a cascade of conformity. A cascade of conformity is turned around by one voice of sanity. Hmm. It always starts with one person. That's why we have a chapter in the book called Be the First to Speak Up. Hmm. And then others grow in their courage and they think differently and they follow. Hmm. So this fish is the voice of sanity and a cascade yeah. of conformity. But I don't think he's on his own. Exactly. And actually, I I like to maintain quite an optimistic view of humanity. I don't think that um, seeing through manipulation is just a genetic trait. I think anybody can learn to be more resilient and to deflect brainwashing and to brush off advertising and information. And we can all choose how we want to be. So everyone could be the the goldfish swimming the other way. Mm. Is there a difference between something I was thinking about when I was reading your book, um, being culturally conditioned? Because we're all culturally conditioned. I mean, however you see, however you see human beings, whether you just see human beings and kind of purely 
um, you know, evolutionary material terms, or whether you think that human beings were, you know, specially created by God or whatever, however you see human beings, I think everyone agrees that we're conditioned from the moment we're born, you know, by our parents, you know, the things your parents teach you, even if you reject them, they go very, very deeply into you somehow, you know, you can never, you can never really escape what your parents teach you, not, not, not completely, or at least it's very difficult to do so. And, and like you say in the book, and I've heard you say elsewhere, there's nothing wrong with um, being influenced, being taught, you know, all of these kind of things, these are sort of natural, normal things. So I guess my question is, what's the difference between that sort of normal, natural conditioning and being brainwashed and manipulated? Mm -hmm. I think it's a difficult line to draw. Mm. I so I don't think I don't think there's an easy answer to this, and I think people will feel that the line is in the sand in a different place. So if you talk about cultural conditioning. I'll put myself in the group of people that used to believe our media was very free. Yeah. And I don't anymore. I think we're culturally conditioned to believe that we live in a free democracy and that yeah. we have liberty. And COVID was an epiphany for me, and I realised that freedom was an illusion. Mm. And since then, I see the media very differently thing is, if you live in a tough jackboot autocracy, you know where you are with the government. And everything here is much softer. And I think that means in a way that we are under the influence of a much softer form of propaganda and manipulation. It's like being under a very soft spell. Nobody knows they're under the spell. Mm. If I watch if I watch TV news or dramas or ads now, I'm kind of astonished. My jaw hits the floor. I can't quite believe what I'm watching. It feels so artificial and manufactured and lacking in truth and authenticity. This isn't to say I never watch TV. You know, there's mm. different box sets I'll watch, but I watch very little. Yeah. And it's the same as well with newspapers. They're they're kind of dripping an opinion. And again, I don't have a problem with that. I am dripping a, with opinion 24-7. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I, I think that we're culturally conditioned to believe we have a level of freedom that we simply don't. Now, I know that's not what you're saying about parents, but it's just the first thing that occurred to me when you said that. Yeah. Also, we used to be culturally conditioned to be quite happy with who we were and proud of ourselves as a nature, to have some self-pride to mm. a good degree. Mm. And now I feel like the cultural conditioning that children are exposed to from a very young age is that of over self-reflection leading to shame almost to self-flagellation there's a lot we're supposed to be um self-critical of and that's another form of of um, cultural conditioning that i'm concerned about you know that children are being brainwashed in a way in school so i used to have this quaint idea that children went to school to be influenced to be educated mm. yeah um to be taught the three r's at primary school yeah and to be taught about subjects you know that if you were learning about biology you were just learning about biology and i don't know if it's changed or if i just didn't notice because i was under a spell of sorts myself at school but i think it has really changed i think that um education is now very brainwashy it's mm. absolutely sedimented with ideology um, children are learning about gender and race in schools that I think is really unhealthy. It's too much. It's not education. It's just not education. They mm. should just be learning to read and write. So um, I think there's a lot of cultural conditioning for people to be, break free from. And I think that's a, a huge challenge. Mm. I think it's going to get, I, th I feel like it's much harder for our children and maybe it will be for their children too than it was for us. Sorry if I'm putting us in the same generation because we're probably not quite, Jamie. <laughs> well, um, I won't comment on that, Laura. Um, but I am, um, I am very. Uh, I come across as very mature for my age. Let's 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 put it that way. Um, no, I, I hear what you're saying. I guess the thing, I, the, one of the things I was thinking about with this book, I really like this book. I think it's great. Is um, uh, oh, can I just say something else yeah, about yeah, that? You see, yeah. So. You know, we have a we have an impression of our education as being something I think it's not. And I think people just need to wake up a little bit. Yes. Chair, Chairman Mao said something about education. He said all work in school 
is for changing the thinking of the students. Yes. Right? They're, re they're really honest about it in communist yes. countries and totalitarian countries. And we're not honest about what's happening here. Yeah. Yeah. OK, well, let me ask you about that then, because, I mean, we, you know, on this on on this show, we we cover stuff that you, we hear from time to time in the news about schools. Um, and we did that uh, story a few weeks ago. You know, it was in uh, was it Rye College where you've got this recording of this teacher castigating these children for saying that a classmate couldn't identify as I think it was a cat or at least I think that was the story anyway. I, mean, I can't quite remember what the audio was, but in any case, it was a teacher who was sort of thoroughly, uh, thoroughly um, ideologically indoctrinated, who was, you know, trying to indoctrinate these children who wouldn't conform to their mad viewpoints about, you know, gender and so on. Um, but I guess the question is, how ubiquitous is that? Because many people would say, well, this is just a kind of, you know, this is a fringe a phenomenon that is not widespread in in school in normal schools in the country i mean is that is that true from your perspective what do you think is it it sounds like you're saying you think it's it's happening all over the place of course it is i mean you'd only have to look at the department for education guidance to see that and um you know you can't have escaped it being the news recently that the government is unsure how to give advice on whether children can change their pronouns at school with or without parental consent because a change would need to be made in the law for children not to be able to change their pronouns at school so um you know ideas that would have been literally unthinkable when yeah. i was a child yeah. are now commonplace protected in law and absolutely being taught by teachers. If I just go on my own son's experience, they've been taught about transgenderism and gender identity ideology for many years. Not really? when they were at primary school, because their mine are now uh, late teens. Mine have actually finished with school. And mm. I'd say one reason they finished with school is they're both really fed up of ideology. Right. I'm kind of surprised that I've got kids who don't want to continue their education at the mm. age of 16 and 18. Multiple yeah. reasons. You know, I think lockdown's also part of that. It completely ruined education and you know the, the much touted social contract between children and teachers um but my son my, my youngest son learned how to ask questions so talking about trans stuff is really common in phse lessons and he learned how to ask questions rather than um definitively state his own opinions as a way to not be ejected from the class or told off although let me tell you questions aren't always welcome yeah. one pshe teacher told the whole class that he was disgusted with them for their views the question my asked my son had asked in that lesson was, but what if a boy thinks he's trans and has his penis cut off and then changes his mind? Right. And the teacher's answer was, well, he can have surgery to get another one, which is about as ignorant as the teacher in the video you mentioned from mm. Rye College. And yes, that incident was about a student identifying as a cat, because I know a bit more about that. And asserting that there are three sexes because there's male, female and intersex. Right. which is completely untrue. There are two sexes and then there are disorders of sexual development. So there's a lot of misinformation, ignorance and ideology, I think, in schools. And I think it's it's widespread. I hear it from, from my friends too. Mm. My, my oldest son would tell me that they knew when they were getting onto this kind of subject and it would creep into all kinds of lessons and he'd just switch off for 20 minutes and go on his phone quietly. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty shocking, isn't it? It is pretty shocking. And um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I didn't have any anything like this when I was in school at all. I mean, this, as you said, it would, it would be completely unthinkable. And it's not only that, but I get the impression that the language of school children is policed in a completely different way. You know, when I was at school, you weren't allowed to swear. You know, you weren't allowed to say the F word and things like that. But kids would call each other all kinds of names now, which I think would probably you know, you probably get expelled for these kind of things now. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a completely different landscape. I mean, I don't know, we haven't, we're not sending our children to school for all these reasons. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I think the, 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 the landscape has completely changed. Oh, gosh, I think you've made a really good decision. If I could go back in time, I wouldn't want mine to go to school, but mm. I, I'd be horribly equipped to homeschool them myself. <laughs> somebody would, somebody else would have to take that over for me, I think. Yeah, well, I think there are all sorts of options, aren't there, for what you can do, and, and not not everyone can homeschool. Um, but I think that, you know, my, my view is that... Um, I mean, it, it ties into this whole conversation about 
this kind of default acceptance of the way things are the sort of default acceptance that you send your kids to school that's just the normal thing to do it's like saying well you watch the bbc you know you watch the bbc news that's just a normal thing to do you just watch it and accept it um actually we're in a we're in a stage now where i think this is a a decision that you've got to consciously think about with your kids you know because this is this this is your precious commodity your children if, if i can put it like that you've got a you've got a very special responsibility for your children to raise them and ultimately it's your decision how they're educated and people it doesn't even seem to occur to people that we still live in a country where it's your decision you know it's your decision you decide to send your children to school so have a think about think about it just think about it i'm not saying that you can't do it but have a think about it think about the other options that there might be there might be a better way um, that's that's just that's just I think you know the first step in in terms of mm. actually being intentional about your kids' education. I think there's far too much naivety about well, you know, I just send my kids to school, and I have seen it in my friends. You know, they've got kids similar age, you know, five six years old. They go to school and they start being taught about you know all sorts of stuff like LGBT ideology and transgenderism from a from an extremely early age, and then the parents are shocked. But you know. Um, it's it's not hard to find out that these things are, are going on. So mm. I think that was um I'd like to say something following on from that about infantilization. Because you said mm. people don't realise that they've got the choice. Well, yeah. first of all, it is it is really it is mind boggling if you're thinking about if you think about homeschooling your children or unschooling them or mm. a different type of schooling, you know, because the default option is you go to school mm. and doing something different is going to be very high maintenance and unnerving. But that said, there is this, there is, there is something about us now where I think we're very infantilized in our relationship with the government. Mm. Think back to COVID. People let the government intrude into every aspect of their lives in a way that I hadn't imagined they would. Mm. You know, I, I spoke to somebody recently who said he was outside the room when his wife gave birth because he thought, if I break in, will they call the police? <laughs> And well, actually, you know, he was very sad about it and he's got a lot of regret and his wife had to give birth on her own because you have to remember that everybody thought the police could be called about anything then because the rules were drummed home so hard. In Boris Johnson's stay home speech on the 23rd of March, he said the police would have the power to enforce the rules. You know, the the, the speech was littered with penalty and power. Mm. So we were it was drummed into us that we had to obey rules. Mm. But imagine not being at the birth of your baby or, you know, weddings being cancelled or people couldn't date. They couldn't mm. have sex with somebody for the first time. You weren't allowed to touch somebody mm. or hug them. Apparently it was never against yeah. the law, but you, you couldn't have had you couldn't have gone on a date or, or had your first time with somebody. And then, of course, funerals. Uh, so the, all these intimate rites of passage were intruded on. And I think one of the moments for me, I thought, now, now will people wake up? But they didn't. Yeah. Was when a journalist asked um, Matt Hancock when we'd be allowed to hug people. And I was like, seriously, if you, if you get to the stage where you're asking your government when you can hug people, you're really lost. You don't, you don't need and you shouldn't need this kind of permission from the government. That's the government firmly embedded in the centre of your family, in the centre of your home and in all aspects of your life. So I think it's no surprise, really, that people question whether they can not send their children to school mm. um, because we have a relationship now where we're looking to the government to tell us what to do in all kinds of areas of life. I mean, now now there are um, flood and heat warnings on GPS when you're driving somewhere. This kind of thing is just becoming absolutely standard in how mm. we live our lives. Yeah. And it's all it's all driven by fear, isn't it? And that's why I think, you know, you're you're that's why you I think your book title, your first book, State of Fear, that just it just it it touches something really central to all of this. Because when I think about the thing about education, I think first there's a fear that people, you know, if you even start thinking about not sending your children to a normal school, you know, you'll be sort of singled out. And it, it actually starts from from the time your children are born. You know, if you don't if you don't um, answer the health visitors' letters, then the worry is they're going to put you on some kind of list, and they're going to be they're going to be saying, well, why, you know, why don't these people want the health visitor to come round? Are they abusing their children? I mean, it doesn't it it doesn't occur to us to think, well, maybe it's just you know my right as a as an as an individual who lives in a in a free ostensibly free country. Uh, just not to have a health visitor come round. I mean, we've, you know, we're on our fourth child. We know 
roughly speaking, how to take care of children now. We don't really need a health visitor, but we still, I mean, we still do it anyway, just because it could create, a, you know, in our minds anyway, I don't know how realistic it is, but, you know, the fear is that it could create a problem if you don't, if you don't have the health visitor. I think the same thing about um, the treatment that we can't mention on, on YouTube is like, if you, if you don't, if you don't just go along with it, the worry is again, you'll be put on some kind of list and, you know, then somebody's going to come around your house and start asking all kinds of other questions. And I don't, I don't know where this fear comes from, but it's definitely there. You know, it's, it's, it, I mean, do you, do you see what I mean? Do you, do you agree? Oh, of course I do. Jamie, yeah. I wrote the book on it, didn't I? That came out May 2021, yeah. a state of fear. Yeah. Um, and but if we do, really... do you know what I mean? It's about everything though. Oh, that's what I'm saying. It's mm. not just about, it's not, it was not just about COVID. It's about everything else. And then you, what, I think the COVID thing, just to elaborate slightly, the COVID, it was the same. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's exactly the same, but definitely for me, it, it just made me aware of things in a whole new way. The closest I got previous to that was all the propaganda uh, around Brexit. I just, I, I found that to be utterly annoying and weird, you know, the way that I felt like we were under some kind of propaganda campaign to try and sort of brainwash us into imagining that this referendum was illegitimate and that the people who had done it were were, were monsters. They, that was the closest I got. But during COVID, I recognised not just what was happening then, but what was happening everywhere, you know, absolutely in all areas of life, including mm. including having, you know, because I had, I had uh, two children at the time, our, our daughter was born during that period. We had her at home, um, and I was I was in the room. But you know, part part of the reason we wanted her to be born at home was because we didn't want to go into a hospital with you know all masks and that kind of nonsense that you mentioned. Um, your friend. And I didn't mean to laugh, by the way. I laughed because it was so you know it was so terrible, really, and outrageous. Not because I think it's funny or something to be laughed at. Um, so the point the point being that for me the COVID thing uncovered all of this fear in in all of these other areas and mm. said, where has this come from well um i mean that's that's complex i'm sure it'd be multifactorial but i think there's something to say about fear of authorities um this is something that we address in the book but only briefly but human beings have an inbuilt authority bias mm. so we are naturally we seem to be naturally wired to respect and follow authority. And of course, this is something that is exploited against us mercilessly in mm. all quarters. But you can see it, um, you can see it in various ways right now. So let's think about AI. Let's not go too, I don't want to derail myself too much talking about AI, but there's a lot of fear about AI that's being ramped up at the moment. And people are investing AI with an authority it simply doesn't have. It doesn't have sentience. It is not equivalent to nuclear weapons, which is what we're told, and it doesn't represent a mass extinction threat. It's a, a very useful tool, which has some opportunities and some threats, but it's a tool and it's the mm. hands of the human beings holding the tool that we should be concerned about. It's the people regulating the tool. It's the people granting permission to access the tool. As always, it's the human beings behind the tool, not the tool itself. Yes. But AI is being invested with authority. We think AI is more powerful than it is because we're being told it's going to acquire sentience and yet mm. there's no evidence at all that it mm. will acquire sentience it may do mm. it may not mm. um the you've got to remember that the the wizard of oz was a very little man with spectacles on behind a curtain he wasn't an all-powerful wizard of oz mm. in the story of the emperor who wore no clothes he was a naked fool, an absolute fool, parading himself naked through the streets of all the townspeople. Mm. We often assume that our leaders have an authority and an infallibility that they don't have. Mm. And it's that fear that actually keeps us in check, keeps us in place. Mm. So it's important to remember with all authorities that they don't necessarily have the power that we invest them in. Mm. I mean, you gave the example of the health visitor. I think there's something to what you say, actually. You know, if you if you chose never to let a health visitor into your home, maybe you would be, um, you know, maybe a flag would be created and they'd be worried that you'd, you'd be abusing your children. But, mm. of course, there are cases where that's happened. And so there are reasons why those checks and balances exist in society. But I'm sure that there is um, absolutely a possibility that you can write to the service and say, thank you very much for your kind attention. This is our fourth child. I, and I don't mean I'm talking to you specifically. I, yes. I just mean general, you know, yes. and um, we we don't feel we require any assistance at the moment, you know. Mm. And, 
you know, I'm sure, sure legally you're allowed to say that, but we often behave out of what is essentially an ir- irrational fear. Mm. And of course, we saw that in bucket loads with COVID. People did things that would make no material difference at all, standing on dots in supermarkets, yeah. wearing a mask to walk into a restaurant, taking it down to eat, then putting it back on to go to the loo. I think people can look back and see that none of those things did anything. Mm. And yet they did it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you this, Laura, and this is uh, this is the kind of question that's on my mind um, quite a lot nowadays. Um, I'm just trying to think of how to phrase it. There's something not right. I mean, I think that you and I agree on that. There's there's something not there's something not right. Um, people are being manipulated. People are being brainwashed. People are being lied to by the media. The you know the current things. You know, I I think with the you know the current things like you know COVID or climate change or uh, the Ukraine war. There's probably some others that I can't think of now. But th- there's degrees of legitimacy to AI, I suppose, would be another one. There's sort of degrees of legitimacy to them all, but they're all utilised in the same way. Um, You know, they're overblown, they're exaggerated, they're used to propagate fear, they're used ultimately to control people, to nudge people on a kind of subconscious level using behavioural psychology, which you've written about so well. So, you know, you and I see this, right? I mean, clearly you see it, and I see it as well, to, to some extent. But how do you um help people to understand this i mean what i know you know you're obviously in a different world and space to me but you know i've got all these parishioners here um uh, in a new place and i was in an old place and it's very similar everywhere how do you how do you help people to to see this how do you sort of help ordinary people decent people to to recognize something of what what's going on something of the manipulation well, I've just written a book about it, haven't I, Jamie? <laughs> well, now, now <laughs> let's, rem- book. let's remember, this is, hello, this is why I'm here. <laughs> read the book. Um, read the book. I mean, we're, we're both in different lanes, but interested in similar subjects. And yeah. so I imagine that what you try to convey to your flock is that we're not supposed to live in fear. We're supposed to have love and faith and mm. hope. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the most depressing things ever for me was churches shutting their door at Easter. You know, I feel like this because I banged yeah. on about it to you yeah, in previous course. podcasts. I mean, my goodness, at the time of the resurrection, church was saying, Oh no, there's a dangerous bug mm-hmm. around. We're gonna, and I know it was genuinely really dangerous to elderly and vulnerable people, but to shut the doors and not give people the choice to come in to mm-hmm. say the most frightening that, thing that could happen is that you die and not that there is life after was some. Um, a pretty strong betrayal of faith from the Church of England. Pretty bloody astonishing. And that's something that really snapped me awake at Easter 2020. I interviewed a priest in his church and it was empty and he's saying the doors were shut and he'd come by one day and there was a woman on the steps kneeling and crying. And I thought, what's the point of you, really? I mean, if 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 you shut the church doors now, when people need you, they might find they don't need you again. Anyway, rant about churches shutting their doors at Easter yeah. over. So, you know, that shouldn't be the message, surely, of the church. And so I'm sure you're addressing it in all of your sermons yeah. every week. Uh-huh. Um, what the important preoccupations of life should be for Christians. Mm. So what I've done is is just use who I am, because I think we are all built fundamentally in our own way, you know, We've got our own blueprint. It's it's our genes. It's the way we've been brought up by parents. Like you say, you can never avoid the influence of your parents mm. and our natural abilities. And I feel that mine are creativity and communication. Mm. I don't know another way to be. Sometimes mm. all I want to do is just sit in the co- sit in the garden and listen to the birds sing. I just want total quiet. I don't want to be part of the world. Yep. to be honest. Mm-hmm. And yet I'm built the way I'm built, which is to be interested in a subject which other people might even find uncomfortable. I find myself drawn to these taboo subjects, the dark recesses of our mind. Mm. I'm interested in looking at those, shining a light on them as bright as I can, investigating, understanding, because I'm always interested in the why. I'm interested in the how, but I'm really interested in the why. Mm. And doing whatever I do, genuinely in service for other people i try i try always to write and communicate in service to other people 
like I said, I'd love to have the secret sauce to write a book that's all about just making tons of money, but it's <laughs> not how I've thought so far. So for me, I address your, your big questions by just being who I am. So I've written a book about it. Yeah. And what I, where I'm at right now, after thinking about all of these questions, which has felt a bit like an existential crisis for me, to be honest, since COVID, is yeah. what makes us who we are mm. why are human beings so flawed what is the meaning of original sin what's the hope for redemption why is the world built the way it is what's the influence of good and evil when you understand these difficult questions what what is it what should we do as individuals about it and i think our individual response has to vary according to who we are there's no there's no government white knight that's going to ride in and save you if you think the government's interested in how you think individually and how you live your life, I've got news for you. Then they're, they're not. You know, there's individual people in government who are very good. There are lots of good individuals, but government is not set up necessarily to allow the individual to be free and to flourish. Mm. We've seen that. Um, and although it sounds depressing, you know, the fact is there are lots of conspiracy theories about governments which have come true. Mm. I draw your attention most specifically to NK Ultra, which has to be one of the most evil government programs i've ever heard of and it went on for two decades yeah. so and, an, I, and i don't i don't know when when people got the idea that governments used to do things like that and then stopped when they don't even really acknowledge they did it and they destroyed all the documents mm. so wake up governments don't aren't, aren't always your friend be skeptical of big brother there isn't an ethical body that's coming to save you that wants you to teach how teach you how to be a free happy flourishing independently thinking person Every single person organisation is going to be imbued with political bias, um, ideological bias. Nobody's unbiased. Nobody's truly non-partisan. And we're told quite often that we have to do things for others, that we have to show solidarity. You know, we need to turn our heating down to save the world. We need to wear our masks to protect someone else, etc. And... Actually, I think what we should be focusing on more than anything, if we care about the future of our society, is self-individuating. That means going back to you, like, who are you? What do you stand for? What are your values? There's a whole chapter in the book. It's our last one, I believe. Stand yeah. for something. Yeah. Because a lot of people are being filled uh, with other people's values or or falling over in the face of these tsunamis of, emo of emojis on social media because they don't know what they stand for. So who are you? What are your principles? What are your guiding principles? What's the North Star of your morality? For a lot of people, it will be religion or God, but it's not for everybody. Some people are agnostic or atheist. Whatever guides you, you should know what guides you. And if you don't know, maybe you need to choose a master. Maybe that is religion. Maybe it's something else. You, you need to choose a set of principles. Because if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. You also need to accept that, in a sense, we're at war. Don't get excited. I'm not going into a big spiritual war of good and evil, although <laughs> we might we might be. But you need to accept that your brain's a battlefield, even if you look at this in the most innocuous terms. We are constantly manipulated from the first time your phone pings at you in the morning to all the branding you'll see when you get out products for breakfast to the moment you put on the TV or the radio to going on social media. We're bombarded with, according to one statistic, the equivalent of 174 newspapers of information every day. Everything's competing for your attention. And of course, the human brain can't consciously deal with this much attention. We're what's known as cognitive misers. Mm. So that's why we have biases built into us. That's why we follow the herd. It's why we have social conformity. There are very good reasons why we're built like this. You know, you don't eat the berries on the bush that no one else eats. Um, if you see a group of hundreds of people running in one direction, you may well follow them. In fact, quick aside, there's a very funny video that went um, so uh, viral on social media. People were sitting in a restaurant in Brazil and a group of marathon runners walked past and people dropped their belongings in the restaurant and they just followed the marathon mm. runners. Yeah. Not because they were joining the marathon, but they thought there must be danger they should run away from. And it's very funny to kind of like laugh at these things, but we're built like this for a reason yeah. because yeah. It's, it's part of our evolutionary success. We're also built with this authority bias. You know, we trust yeah. our leaders. I bet that worked brilliantly when you're in a little tribe of 200 people and you had 
on King to follow. Um, I think it's used against us now. Yeah. And also we run very much on emotion and principally fear, but also um, hope uh, and, mm. and other desires. So, oh my goodness, I've made this such a long answer. I forgot where <laughs> I started. Can you remind me where I started, Jamie? Um, I was. I think it was when I asked you, you know, how to help people wake yes. up. Yes, you know? here we go. So yeah. except you're at war, there's a lot of information. Yeah. And because we have biases, these biases are used against you. So yes. everybody from brand A um, trying to make you buy their product of a brand B or the charity that's trying to stop you in the street or the social media that does not want to lose your attention at all, which is why yeah. it's going to ping you notifications all day to the government propagandists. They all want to get into your brain. Your brain's a battlefield. You're the target. So that's another thing you can do to, um, to understand and protect yourself. Just know that there's a lot of inf information and manipulation. Forewarned is forearmed. It's one of the three main psychological principles that will protect you from manipulation. The mm. second thing is understand the tactics. We have a chapter in the book called Get Immunity, where we detail different types of nudges and propaganda techniques, because if you know how to spot them, you'll know how to resist them. I'll give you one tiny example that's used all the time. Everybody does shopping online now for one thing or another. So you recognize this. You might be looking at a product on an online shop and it says only two left. Oh, yeah. Maybe there are two left, maybe there aren't, I have no idea. But mm -hmm. seeing there's only a couple left makes you think, oh, this is in high demand, there's not many, I want this. So mm -hmm. you're more likely to buy. That's why they do it. It's playing on your scarcity bias. Mm -hmm. So we detail all of those. Once you understand the, the tricks, you are more likely to spot them, be able to resist them. If a magician revealed how he did a card trick to you, you'd always know how to watch for it with mm. any other magician. You'd see that trick again and you'd know how it's done. So that's another principle. And finally, you can have a dialogue with yourself. Mm. You know, you can say, I know this is manipulation, so I'm going to resist it. Or I know what my principles are, so I'm not going to be led down this path I'm not sure I agree with. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot that people could do. And that's that's the point of my whole book. Yeah. It's about giving people agency to yeah. resist the manipulation. Absolutely. absolutely. Can we can we talk just a little bit more about the manipulation and and about the, the whole concept of a what what's actually going on in terms of a sort of battle between good and evil? So I just want you to say something because I'm sort of mindful about who might be watching this and i really hope people are watching this and think and there are some people who are thinking oh i didn't really sort of really realize this was going on or, i've never really heard of that the mk ultras or i've never heard of uh behavioral psychology or whatever it might be or mind space i'm sure you know what i'm sure you know what mind space is um I've, I've, mind space is a government document i was actually writing something about this the other day uh which is is subtitled is influencing behavior through public policy and you can just literally Google it, right? So this comes from the government. Mm. I just read a quotation from it. This is These are the words of the government. The cab this comes from the cabinet office. Mindspace mm -hmm. effects depend at least partly on the automatic system. This means that citizens may not fully realize that their behavior is being changed, or at least how it is being changed. Clearly, this opens government up to charges of manipulation. People tend to think that attempts to change their behavior will be effective if they're simply provided information in an above board way, which means that people are aware of it. Um, people have a strong dislike of being tricked. This dislike has a psychological grounding. Um, well, that's a funny thing to say, isn't it? But fundamentally, it is an issue of trust in government. So trust Big Brother, it, you know, we're, we're, we are influencing you, manipulating yeah. you on a cycle on a subconscious psychological level. So you're not even aware of it, but it's okay because you can trust us. Mm. I mean, and people don't even know this this yeah. heard of mine. Okay. No so it is. it's a good point. Let's go backwards a couple of steps. First of all, um in this book, my last book, A State of Fear, I have a long explanation all about mind space. I yeah. go through what each of the letters oh. stand for. So for instance, M, it's an acronym. M is messenger. That's that's our bias where we are more likely to like, respect, and follow um mm. the advice of somebody we look up to such as it could be a celebrity or it could be the head of the nhs or your local faith leader whoever um and each one of those letters is um a different bias so incentives norms defaults salience priming effect commitments ego um again it's detailed in this book we talk about mind space in the get immunity chapter and when I came across Mindspace, which I think dates from 2011, I was pretty shocked. Um, of course, it's been contested ever since. 
Claire Fox, Baroness of Buckley, has been talking about this for years. She's mm. brought it up in the House of Lords. Um, I used some of the quotes from that to support a, a bigger petition I made, really, to um, the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee to ask them to ask the government to investigate its own use of behavioural science. Even the behavioural psychologist who wrote Mindspace and who ran the Nudge Unit, that's the Behavioural Insights Team, has said the public should be consulted upon mm. the use of nudges. So nudges are subtle, subliminal, covert attempts to make you change your behaviour. It's supposed to give you a choice. It's not supposed to be a mandate, although we know mandates often follow. They're mm. little choices that are supposed to guide you into the correct behaviour, Jamie, so mm. you know how to be behave you know, according to your own best interests and to make you a healthy, good model citizen. Yeah. I am dripping with sarcasm if you can't hear me. <laughs> um, I can hear. So it is, it is quite an astonishing document. And the, the section on trust I find fascinating. I just wrote a, a, a nice long feature on the subject of trust for Perspective magazine, really with everything that's in mind space at the heart of it, because the government asks us to trust the government. But trust is reciprocal and it is also based upon telling the truth over a period of time. Now, ask yourself this. If the government is nudging you, i.e. it's giving you little subliminal covert choices and messages to alter your behaviour without telling you, does that imply that the government trusts you? When the government has misinformation units, disinformation units, is conducting shadowy surveillance of citizens on social media, as we have found out through the Big Brother Watch report or through, um, you know, uh, subjects access requests that individuals have done to the government or you know take it across the pond to the us's twitter files should we trust that government you know the government the government doesn't trust us ergo mm. they use nudge um propaganda censoring surveillance and so you have to ask yourself how much you should trust the government back i think we're in a very very depressing state of trust between government and citizens the what was a transactional relationship has changed and i think nudge actually Actually, is a very inherent part of what changes the relationship with you mm. and government. Mm. I think a lot of people can feel um, a sense of darkness and mm. evil in the world. I think it starts a lot earlier, you know, um, way beyond the, the the phase you're talking about, you know, the decriminalisation of drugs, for instance. I, you know, I live in a pretty leafy suburb of Surrey, and I know lots of young people who are pretty lost on drugs mm. every day of the week. Um, I see that as dark and evil frankly mm. and when i hear metropolitan elites talking about further decriminalizing cannabis and other drugs i think you're you're mad you've got no idea what's actually happening out there in the world families and generations are totally ruined mm. by drugs just because you went to oxford and you still got a first well done you mm. don't know who you'd have been otherwise had you not taken drugs and somebody who didn't have your life chances who was born in social housing to parents who have no job they're not going to get they're not going to get first in oxford after the generational trauma caused by families on drugs so i get quite angry about that kind of thing um bringing it up to date with something like climate i find it fascinating that a lot of the same tactics are being used now for uh climate scaremongering as we used during covid i think many more people are alive to it now they notice mm. it but I find it disarming when I hear world leaders talk in very apocalyptic terms and they can't be stupid. They know they're talking about predicted temperatures which are yet to pass. They must know there's a great deal of uncertainty in some of the science that they're saying is certain. And when they say things like the world is boiling, we're into the area of global boiling, I think, what are, what are you saying? You know, this kind of like the whole one one minute to midnight, which was talked about a few years ago. Well, if that was one minute to midnight, where we now we're past midnight and we're all still here. Mm. If they're if they're um, ramping up the propaganda and the nudging and the fear so much right now, why is that? What's next? So that's that's what I'm like. I think, gosh, you know, what's what's the plan behind? behind this because I don't see it just as a genuinely good-hearted response from concerned environmentalists put it that way and I put myself in the concerned environmentalist bracket right. um this is a very deliberate propaganda uh campaign to frighten people and it's to frighten them to decarbonize their lifestyle whatever that means towards a contentious political goal which is 
net zero. And I'm not sure where it's really heading. But when so many world leaders um, leap upon something like forest fires in Greece and say, absolutely straight out, this is caused by climate change, but they're ignoring the local authorities who say it's caused by arsonists. You have to wonder what's happening. That's something that to me feels quite dark because after all, um, saying that something is a truth when it's more complicated that is effectively a lie. Mm. A lie is keeping people in the dark. Well, darkness thrives in the dark. So that make, that makes me feel a little bit alarmed. That's mm. another example of something that feels dark to me, something that feels like it should be good. You're talking about looking after the planet has become something that feels like it's motivated by darker ulterior motives. Mm. I don't claim to, I don't claim to know what's going on or what's causing it. I just know how it feels. Mm. And I've got to 50 ripe old years and I'm a lot more confident about trusting my instincts now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that thing you say about, you know, not knowing where it comes from, but knowing how it feels, that's the way I feel about it i don't really know what the answer or I, I don't know what the answer is you know to to why they're doing it uh, but i can see what is happening and um oh well may i say one more thing about that yeah, sorry course, that course, occurs yeah. to me the other reason i know that something about it feels wrong and feels dark is a deliberate plan to frighten children and children are co-opted into this hmm. and that's wrong hmm. you know at school um, climate is embedded into all aspects of the curriculum, but in a way that's quite frightening. Go to the children's book section of a bookshop and see how many books are about the dangers to the planet. Um, look at children's programming. You get news ticker tapes on Sky Children's programs with climate information in a way that's designed to make them alarmed. You know, the EastEnders closing credits showed what London would look like if it was two metres underwater, which is a projection even the IPCC says is implausible. And after all, we have a Thames barrier to deal with it should mm. should sea levels rise like that. You know, the Netherlands manages to stay dry mm. using very medieval technology to present floods, prevent mm. floods. Um, this is all about raising fear levels. On Earth Day, um, it, was it last year? Uh, it was announced that it would be a natural history GCSE or saving the planet GCSE, as some people called it. And at COP26, Nadim Zahawi said that education was one of our best weapons in the fight against climate change. Weapons. Which brings us back to the Chairman Mao quote earlier, um, that all education is for the purpose of changing the thinking of the students. There are now grief networks for young people who are undone by anxiety about climate so deliberately frightening children um for any cause i think is unacceptable mm. and it shows that there are some people who believe the ends justify the means mm. I, I just don't know what their ends are to be honest yeah that's that's yeah that's i agree with you and you can kind of see i mean i sort of see a trajectory and i imagine there may be certain things that would happen on this trajectory but I don't, I don't know what, to what end. It just feels to me very dark. So, for example, Tom and I were talking on our last podcast about, you know, the whole concept of climate lockdowns. And, you know, that sounds in a way um, alarmist and like it would never happen. You'd never have a, a, a March 2020, you know, 23rd of March 2020 moment where the prime minister comes on the TV and says, right, everyone stay at home. Uh, because of the climate but you you could have a situation whereby you know if you take um the church as an example people say well or even the church of england probably come out with it you know we probably don't even need to be told the the central church of england says well you know what you might want to consider um a less regular pattern of services because uh, then that will decrease the carbon footprint of the church and that's like the same kind of thinking it might be on a it may be on a lesser scale, but it's basically the same thing, isn't it? It's not going to church as much to save the environment. And then, well, why don't we just why don't we just close the church down altogether? Why don't we just put it all online? And, and you're in the same you're in the same space. So it's almost like the the behavioural. It's almost like you don't need you don't need Boris Johnson on TV telling you. It's like they're pushing us in that direction anyway to make us do it automatically. And I find exactly it really through multiple multiple techniques and multiple routes, of course. Um, so we've had newspaper articles about will this will this change? Will, will the this heat wave hysteria? You know, the, I'm sorry, I'm calling it heat wave hysteria, but the, but the, the newspapers were just 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 about on the basis of climate catastrophe. Will that change how we go on holiday? Will we stop going abroad because it's too hot? Um, or uh, 
schemes that are supposed to discourage driving, which of course are spreading in different ways. You know, it's not just a congestion charge. Now there's ULES and then ULES expands in the area and then it's coming to every town and city near you, according to Labour. And then Steve Khan is talking about charging per mile driven and you see where it's going. It's about making car ownership and driving very inconvenient, very costly, um, and also something to be ashamed of because you're contributing towards climate catastrophe. So that's another way, embedding it in the curriculum so that that's children are being brainwashed with it through every subject. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's happening through multiple uh, routes. And fear, of course, is at the heart of it. Um, talking about modelling that shows heat-related deaths, when people are told that 11,000 people died in Europe from the heat this summer, they're not told it's a model, that actually that death registration data hasn't been gathered from the different countries. There'd be literally no way of knowing in real time while you're in the summer how many people have died because of heat. And then it's it's about presenting it without context. It's being framed as um, heat-related deaths being a very significant problem, but without us being told that more than 10 times as many people die from the cold every winter mm. so there are there are lots of um there are lots of ways that uh behavioral scientists and propagandists are chipping away at you to make you decarbonize your lifestyle not least um a publicly published document uh, produced by the nudge unit and sky about how to the how the power of tv will help people decarbonize their lifestyle and it's really for this reason that in free your mind we chose the environment as a case study mm. because Regardless of where you are on climate change and anthropogenic climate change and the solutions to deal with it, the fact is climate has turned out to be an astonishing example of how different techniques are used to manipulate you to change your behaviour. Mm. So it's it's a real current, topical, timely, standout example. So we've we've gone into it in detail in the book about the different nudges and the types of propaganda and mm. the different organisations involved. And I think you'd probably get a sense if you read the book which flag our colours um, are are nailed to, uh, sorry, which mast our, our, our colours are nailed to. But it's really not about our, our ideological or political or, or climate beliefs. We're just, it's just such um, an all-encompassing topical example of, of nudge and manipulation that we, we had to give it, really. It would be remiss not to. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I see I see what you're saying. I think I think you're I think you're doing a great job of helping people to understand the ways they're being manipulated whilst trying to um uh, I mean am I right in saying this not n- not sort of manipulate people yourself by sort of trying mm-hmm. to to force them into certain viewpoints right so you could so I mean, look, I'm. I I think that. No, go on. You can go there. You can accuse me well, of no, I mean, I, I think... people into buying a book. I don't mind. <laughs> I can take no, no, it. No, no. What I mean is, you're not trying to force people. If people, if people are convinced, I like, say people are really convinced that the climate change thing is is real. Not only is the climate changing, but human beings have caused it, and we need to, you know, decarbonize as a result. Okay, that could all theoretically be true. I mean, I don't believe it's true personally. I think it's I think it's uh, almost entirely false. But um, say it's say it's true. Um, you could still be being manipulated into behaving in certain ways, couldn't you? That's 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 yes. kind of the point I'm trying to make. Is like you could still believe yeah. that, but you can still also recognise that there are unethical ways of manipulating you on a psychological on a subconscious psychological level, and then causing you to act in certain ways which are you know undemocratic. Uh, they are you know under the radar they're not happening consciously uh which you could still object to and i think that's i think there's a point isn't it laura i think it's an important thing it's kind of like a tactical it's kind of like a tactical question of how you actually how you actually help people you know whether it's to just come at them and say look this is you know this is not true for all of these reasons and try and present people with the empirical facts and with arguments and with reason and logic or whether or so that's one thing but then on the other hand there's the there's the question of means and, and yeah. the ethics of the means and i think your your thing is about the ethics of the means in in this yes yeah. it look it's it's the whole teach a man to fish example yeah. um yeah. i don't want to tell people what fish they should eat and put it on their plate for them i want to teach them how to fish and yeah. that's what that's what the book's about it's about developing psychological resistance uh resilience and it's about being sovereign of your own mind so yes climate is one of the case studies in the book we also talk about dating videos we also talk about q and on there's a lot of different a lot of different um examples of manipulation in the book um but 
the point the point is about climate when we wrote this last year we didn't know that this summer that weather maps would be turning lurid purple they'd start using modeled heat related deaths and we didn't know that um ursula von der leyen would say that the wildfires were caused by climate change even though the people in votes are saying it's caused by arsonists we didn't know any of that would happen we picked it last year because it was already a standout example of different manipulative techniques now i gave a talk at um blackwell's bookshop this week with my brilliant co-author patrick fagan mm. um it's blackwell's in oxford which is such a great bookshop yeah. they always do really good talks there and we have a packed audience and afterwards people come up to us ask us to sign the book and go through questions that they didn't get a chance to do during the session. And one man was quite shirty with me, actually. He said, but I'm really, I said, I thought that was really interesting, but I'm really angry. You talked about climate change. I said, oh, why's that? He said, because climate change is real and people should be frightened. I went, okay. Well, I haven't said what I think about climate change. Mm. Um, this isn't about what I think about climate change. And in fact, we say in the book, whatever you think about climate change, whether it's man-made and what the proposed solutions to deal with it should be, We've just used it as an example of all the different types of manipulation. Mm -hmm. And you make up your own mind. Yeah, but you are really telling people to think. Said, well, no, not really, because I actually believe by the time you've read our book, you're about to shrug any of our manipulation techniques off like water off a duck's back anyway, because each chapter is designed to give you psychological mm -hmm. resilience and to point out the techniques. I certainly can't claim that we're not trying to influence people. We most definitely are. I don't want 10 people to buy this book. I want lots and lots and lots of people to buy this book. And I mm. want it to completely change their thinking. Mm. But that's not the same as wanting to tell them what to think. I don't want to tell them what to think. I want them to be able to choose um, how to filter and control information that goes into their brain. I don't want to tell them what to think. So it's definitely an exercise in influence. Mm. But I hope the book isn't an exercise in manipulation. Yeah, and I, I see what you're saying. And I think there are clearly ethical forms of persuasion, aren't there? Um, like like I say, ethical forms of persuasion would be to um, use things like facts, reason, argument, logic, um, and, and, and things of that sort, right? Uh, the truth, to, to be genuinely convinced of the truth yourself and to want to share the truth with other people. That's an ethical stance to take when you're trying to persuade someone of something. And there are unethical forms of of persuasion, sorry, such as like violence, for example, to, to threaten someone that if they don't do X, Y, and that if they don't believe something, that X, Y, and Z might happen to them or that you might do X, Y, or Z to them. Um, and I would I would categorize this subconscious form of persuasion as as manipulation and unethical as well because it's doing something that's not that people don't consent to you know it's it's um it's deceitful in in that regard and i think there is something deeply wrong with it particularly when you have a um you know a a, a modern government with sophisticated technology and they have such access they have they have such um i think this is one of the things that's really pernicious about it they have such a high level of trust and influence and they abuse it and i think that's that makes it far worse it's like yeah you know when you see these you know see when i think about the people i know who are manipulated by it the reason that they're manipulated by it is basically because they're decent people who trust what they're told by the government and that's yes that makes it despicable in my opinion that they but there's, there's, there's the another government. chapter in the book called the illusion of choice and i'd say that part of this actually i'm just thinking this this point through for the first time but we invest the government with our power when we vote mm. you know we give a little bit of our power away we're presented with party a party b maybe party c party loony independent whatever and you you make your you make your, your choice basically it's between two parties isn't it so you have this illusion of choice and in doing so you invest some of your power so therefore you do grant some trust some power and some confidence in the government i haven't i i mean i I haven't voted in the last couple of elections. I can't. I'm spoiling my ballot. I go and I spoil my ballot because I feel like I should turn up and do something. Mm. But I can't vote for anybody at the moment. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I mean, all I'd say to that is that um, many people would say that we actually live in a in a in a country which gives the illusion of being a democratic country because we don't actually have any alternative to vote for that's that's realistic in any way. And that's I mean, I think the fact that you spoil your ballot is indicative of that reality. It's, I mean, democracy is only meaningful is if you actually have some kind of alternative. Whereas at the moment, it seems like we've got a bad alternative or mm. a worse alternative if we have regime change. But let me, Laura, let me um, put something to you. 
uh, I've got two. I've got two. Broadly speaking, two more things I want to I want to ask you about. So, or just share with you. So, the first one is this thing about um, left and right, because I've read uh, your book recently. I've also read another book um, by a Christian author called Justin Briley, and um, but in both books, you're trying to be balanced in order to um, to um, to make your make your message as as accessible for people as possible. And as I say, I don't have any problem with that at all um but i have my own agenda and um and when i think i think well what i think is that the manipulation and the the kinds of things that we're talking about is coming from the progressive liberal left i don't believe it's coming from any genuine sort of conservative or traditionalist uh, sources it's 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 powered by a political philosophy and i think the political philosophy is uh, it has to be progressive because progressivism is about change it's about forcing people not forcing people necessarily but it is about forcing people really it's about the elite forcing the people into a certain direction and away from other forms of you know traditional uh, association um and this this dialectic has uh, has been going on, you know, for the entirety of the, the modern period. This dialectic between something genuinely conservative, not just like a slower, a slower version of progressive liberalism, but a, an actual conservative political philosophy, which is about, uh, you know, it's about community, it's about institutions, it's about churches, it's about it's about um, organic forms of organization. And in that in that political philosophy, it would be the the government and the elites tasked to um to safeguard those ways of life so there's that but then on the other side the kind of progressive liberal side the role of the government isn't about safeguarding the way of the life of the people it's about moving the people on in a certain direction whether that's a whether that's a social direction social progressive liberalism or whether it's a kind of economic direction that you'd get in um a kind of a more sort of uh, capitalist or free market or conversely sort of marxist direction but I mean, and and maybe it's a semantic maybe it's a semantic argument, but that's my theory about about why all this is coming from the left. It's because it's progressive. It's about trying to it's about trying to move people. It's about trying to attack traditional forms of institution. And so, I mean, I don't know anything about I don't know anything about QAnon. I have to say, I just don't know anything about it. I've just heard I've just heard it, but I've just heard the the, tar- the term, and I know it's something to do with paedophilia, uh, you know, and, and elites. But I do think this is a lab, left liberal progressive thing. So anyway, I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Um, well, you know, like you say, we don't really go into politics in the book because it's not about that. It's about it's it's almost the opposite. It's about giving yeah. the individual agency. That's what yeah. we want. So the paradigms I'm interested in are not left and right. I see them as meaningless. I hear everything you're saying about conservatism, um, yeah. you know, that we, that we have we've lost we've lost an interest and we've lost the fight in conserving and protecting what is good about society. Um, and it's been steamrolled by a, a progressive move towards upsetting all the apple carts and turning everything on its head yeah. right now. I don't know. I'm, I don't know how much hope I've got that, that conservatism can actually conserve anything that's, that's left or what's yeah. left that's worth conserving. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not really that interested in left and right. I don't hold any magical solutions to our political problems. I'm more interested in authoritarianism and liberty as a mm-hmm. paradigm. And also this idea of us being a homogenous group mm-hmm. and the individual having dignity and agency. Yes. And I I come back to some of the great thinkers after World War II and Jung's book, which was about self-individuation, which I believe in really passionately. We have mm-hmm. to start with ourselves. And that doesn't mean being selfish. I want to talk about self-individuation. It means having strong values for yourself as an individual because strong groups and societies and countries are made of strong individuals. So to start with, you have to invest the individual with a sense of dignity and agency and sovereignty. And I think that's what's lacking, that actually our institutions and the government want to ride roughshod over our individual dignity. We're supposed to all think the same way. You said before, has it got worse? I feel it has. Mm. Um, and I'm going to draw a distinction as well between companies and governments, because I'm while I do not believe there's necessarily any such thing as a neutral nudge, I don't really like any kind of covert influencing. It is inescapable. All mm. language is influence and manipulation. Mm. It's as old as humanity. 
But I take very little issue with Unilever trying to get you to buy their products over Mm. Procter & Gamble. Because first of all, Unilever doesn't have a misinformation unit. It doesn't have truth verifiers. It's just a company trying to get you to buy stuff. You choose whether you go into the supermarket or not. Um, We don't get the same choice about being citizens and part of a country. So I I take a lot more issue with government doing it. They don't actually um, announce on their manifesto what they're spending on behavioural science and government communications and nudging. So Mm. we're we're very much in the dark about how much we're kept in the dark as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the paradigm I'm interested in more is this idea that we're all a group. We've all got to be told how to think of as a group. We've got to behave in the right way versus being allowed to be individuals. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, that's kind of why I said, you know, to a certain extent, it's, a, it's probably a semantic argument because I think terms like left and right have broken down. I, I suppose the, the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a there's a common political outlook which – um is shared by all of the all of the kind of institutions the government age the, the governments around the world or the think tanks there's a common kind of thread that runs through all of them and that's a sort of that's a di- that's a progressivism fundamentally it's about trying to move people on and um create a different world which is which is dreamt up by intellectuals and using abstract ideas and so on and so forth mm. and and it's actually not um it's actually not just a left-wing thing because ultimately it's a right-wing thing as well as i've already said because it's 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 shared by certain types of um uh, sort of um ca- capitalist outlook as well so so it may be maybe right and left isn't the right word maybe it's progressivism or conservatism um but an actual conservatism, not the kind of conservatism that's represented by the Conservative yeah. Party. Anyway, I don't, I don't want exactly. to get no, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think actually, I don't, I don't really see how anyone can look at a lot of aspects of progressivism and think think it's been good. Yeah. Think about declassifying um, cannabis to to be. You know, we have this constant debate about whether it should be B or C, and then and then people get kind of lost in the idea lost in this idea of trying to grade drugs well this grading isn't based on anything scientific anyway it's it's a bit like tears in covid when people are arguing about which tier their area should be in but they'd already they'd already at that point then lost the battle about whether there was any cost benefit analysis moral justification to lock down the country so i don't really see how anyone can argue that progressivism has has helped the drug situation in this country more people on drugs than ever it's not good yeah, 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 absolutely. And I guess maybe, maybe what I'm trying to drive at is that underneath, it's it's almost like you've got several, you've got several layers on which you're being manipulated. But I think sort of underneath almost absolutely everything is the sort of base fundamental assumption that society is moving in a certain direction, which is broadly speaking, a good direction, and that we all have to kind of pull together in order to bring about the change that we want to see. And it's, it's, it's a it's a kind of brainwashing that goes so deep that it means that we're almost conceptually it's almost conceptually impossible for us now to to imagine that society doesn't have to be like that you can just have some things which are good which aren't changing mm. and moving in a certain direction like the institution of the family for example like the institution of the church um, and you could name very other uh, very many others as well quite easily but do you see what I mean? It's it's a it's a I think it's a subtle, um, but nevertheless complete sort of comp- ubiquitous and and um, insidious way of way of being almost. It, uh, yes, it, it's a precondition for anxiety, isn't it? Because because yes. it makes you feel anxious because you've got to be doing stuff all the time. You've got to be moving in the right direction and going with the herd. And I yes. guess that so, I'm trying to get out. So that's the progression of my last two books, in a sense. You know, I started with very much kind of this is the state we're in book and this is the state the government's got into. It's a state of fear in yeah. order to induce compliance, in order to induce movement into what they wanted to be the new normal. Yeah. OK, so I don't know. I mean, I, I tried to think through what the next step should be in that book, but I wrote it very much in the thick of things. You've got to remember mm-hmm. it was out in May 2021. I wrote it in 2020. So I said, you know, we need to ask the government to investigate it to use behavioural science, the use of fear and nudge and not ethical by government. Mm. Um, we, we've got to keep writing this story ourselves. Free Your Mind is me writing the story. It's it's kind of realising, well, you're going to have to go back and start with yourself. And I've become a lot more open-minded, for instance, to religion 
in the course of writing a book. Not that it's necessarily an answer for everyone, but that you need a crucible for morality. This is no great watershed moment because it's why people have gone to a place of worship on the same day of the week, every week, forever. It's Mm. why people join the Boy Scouts or go to their allotment because community with people with like-minded values. And so I'm not, I'm not putting church and allotment on the same level, but I'm showing that there's a multiple, there are multiple ways that people find groups of like-minded people with values Mm -hmm. And I think we've really lost our way. So the final chapter finishes with you. What are your values? You need a set of of guiding principles in life. Um, I decided to be more open minded to religion this year. I'm going to church more. Um, I don't know if it's the answer for me. I've always had a strong sense of faith. Mm. Um, I've always believed in God. I mean, it's interesting for me that just when I thought I'm more interested in this, I find that, um, you know, I, I have a I have a, a road to Damascus moment as the church has a road to Davos moment. <laughs> and I don't I don't feel myself fitting in that well, although there are some good churches out there. Mm. Um, but I think I think it is it's beholden upon everybody to not just take your values from outside sources unquestioningly in this world, which is very fast paced, very chaotic. And the values are changing so fast. We, we can barely keep our wits about us. You have to come back into yourself. It could be through meditation. It could be through a place of worship and consider for yourself what your values are. OK, yeah. Well, I mean, it won't. I'm glad here that you're going to church, uh, Laura. That's 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 brilliant. And you, it won't surprise you to hear me say that, um, uh, given my position. Um, and it won't surprise you to say that. Um, when I so I asked some of our listeners, you know, I'm, I'm on with Laura Dosworth. You know, have you got anything to say to her? You know, about this, about about free your mind and everything like that. And a number of them said, um, you know, it's all very well and good to free your mind, but you know, in order to in order to be truly free, you have to know the truth, right? And that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. You know, I I, I believe that there are some things which people might find helpful, you know, like say mindfulness or certain types of meditation or whatever it might be. But ultimately I believe that the way that you free your mind is through knowing Christ, you know, because Christ is is the truth and the the ultimate and the ultimate embodiment of truth that we can know in this life is Jesus Christ. That's what I believe. And that's 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 why that's why I think that only through knowing him can we be truly free. You know, we have we have the verse from the, the Gospel of John on our on our theme tune, you know, Carbon Mike saying, you know, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And ultimately that's that's what I believe that this is the it's not it's not just enough to empty your mind with all the crap. You have to fill it with the truth, right? And I don't know, I just I just think that that's I'm not saying it's it's simple. But uh, that's just the way I see it. But I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, with all due respect to you and your listeners, and I do love your opening quote, I I, I am not there with you on that. Right. I yeah. don't. Because I, I think that there are the same essential truths at the heart of other religions and other mm-hmm. ways of being as well. So I don't believe that someone is only, only knows the truth through Jesus. Right. So I'm I'm not there with you on that. But I think that faith is very important for me mm-hmm. the other thing is that the faith is something that we we intuit very deeply and it's not easily communicated mm. you can never really know what someone else's faith means to them mm. yeah but you nevertheless agree with what i said about you do need to fill your mind with something that's true after yes. you've emptied it of yes. all, for all the rubbish yeah. Yes, it's not our last chapter for no reason. I think it's yeah. the most imp- it's the most important thing. But yeah. that doesn't that this book is not about religion consciously because we want to speak. I, I don't even actually really know deep down what Patrick's spiritual and religious beliefs are because mm-hmm. we, we co-authored this book and he yeah. doesn't know yeah. mine. There are things he wrote and I was like, oh no, you can't say that about God. That's not going in. Mm. Uh, or you know, we we picked each other up on it on a few places. It's more that we. Um, refused content rather than demanded it because this isn't a book about it isn't a book about religion it's a book about manipulation of course there's ways in which manipulate uh, religion manipulates people and, and we give an example I, I interviewed um father daniel mm-hmm. uh, for this book and i i wanted to understand more about the techniques the church uses and of course this isn't to say they're bad 
you know, we talked about the incense. What's the point of the incense? I uh, I didn't really get it. I was thinking about it in terms of smell. And he was talking about the fuzzy plumes that might help your eyes lose focus a bit and lose yourself in the moment. Stop. Hang on, Jamie. I can see that you're building up to tell me something completely different about incense. But let me finish describing my you conversation. Read, you read my mind. Yeah. First, I can only see you twitching it, anxious <laughs> to say something. Um, and, you know, chanting, standing up, sitting down, being in that beautiful architecture. What if it's a nice church that kind of leads your soul to soar upwards? There are lots of techniques the church uses to get you into a worshipful frame of mind. And that isn't a bad thing because language, what we do with our body physically, our sensations and the environment all lead towards you being in a certain frame of mind. You can experience that whether you're in a casino, a church or a concert. You've got to sometimes just choose where you're going and who you're listening to to get the desired result. Sometimes it's okay to give yourself over to techniques to get you to a place you want to be. I mean, controversially, Patrick talks about how he really quite enjoyed an experience he undertook to be brainwashed. He went to go Mm. do a masculinity retreat in the woods, which used every technique in the book. You know, he was naked. He was hungry. He was cold. He was tired. He was shouted at and he did group activities. This was all to break him down to rebuild him. He Mm. knew what he was doing consciously. He really liked the end result. They're not still kind of trying to get money out of him or make him do it again or anything. It's like he's joined a cult. But Mm. there are times when we may choose to give ourselves over to an experience because we perceive it as being for our benefit. Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, Go on then. What do you want to say about uh, incense? Go on. You were twitching. I'm sorry. Uh, Well, (laughs) this is uh, people always say this to me like they can just see on my face what I think about things. I'm not very good at disguising it. Um, I've just never I've never heard that before about incense. And um, it's it's definitely not something that um, I've ever experienced, like my eyes blurring or anything like that. To me, like the incense is about. Yeah, a Catholic worship, you know, small C Catholic worship is about the senses, right? So it's about it's about having a sensory experience of worship, not just a not just a cognitive experience, but something which engages all your senses. So the the incense is about it is about it's about vision and it's about smell. It's about the it's about the the aroma of heaven. Um, and it's about you know it, it sort of evokes various biblical scenes the Isaiah chapter six the the smoke rising like incense the prayers of the saints are rising like incense in the book of Revelation and everything like that so I'd see it I'd see it far more in that I'd say see it far more in that way so that was all my my facial expressions <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure Daniel has got a reason. <laughs> Um, but I w- yeah. but I will say that what he said about it visually really resonated because the smell's never done it for me. I mean, I right. love the smell of incense. I burn it in my house yeah. every day. I love yeah. the smell of incense. Yeah. But it, it, that's that's never got me into a worshipful frame of mind. But understanding it on a visual level, I was like, wow, it does do that to me. Mm. I do look at how it rises up through yeah. the space in the church. Yeah. It does make me feel like I'm somewhere just a tiny bit otherworldly, that mm. thin space feeling. Mm. And it's worked for me on a visual level. So actually, that was very helpful for me to understand. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it is about it's about things rising, which is about mm. uh, Gothic architecture is like that. But it's 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 literally designed to make your your eyes move upwards, which, as you say, elevates the soul as well. So you've got the incense rising, you've got the arch, you know, sprung arches, which lead your eyes upwards, mm-hmm. up to heaven, up to the ceiling. You know, that's that's the whole point of it. And and as you say rightly, there's clearly a difference between. You know, I don't know what you would even call it, sort of artistic forms of. Um, helping people to sort of get into a a, a sense a frame of mind or accessing a transcendent space or something like that one wouldn't want to say that all of those things are are manipulative uh, because that would be mm. to to call all art and anything that that attempted to to make you transcend the mundaneness of ordinary life manipula- manipulation and i don't think anyone would want, anyone would want to say that I, and I'd have to think a bit more about, I think it's a really interesting question. I have to think a bit, bit more about it, but I think it has to be, the, the the difference has to be when there is some kind of unethical motivation or means involved, some kind of mercenary means or something like that. Like you say with, with Patrick, I really enjoyed that chapter in the book. I thought it was an excellent chapter uh, when he was sort of, you know, involved in this sort of strange uh, masculinity retreat. Where he was like um, hooded and stuff and shouted out and all that kind of stuff. It was it was really interesting. Made but, me laugh a lot too. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> um, but if he'd if then they'd sort of followed up by trying to get him to go back or you know try to extort money out of him, then it would cross the line from something that he participated in freely, knowing what he was getting into, knowing that was a way way out if he wanted to stop it, and it crossed the line from that to. Well, actually, something else is going on now. There's there's another there's another agenda at work here, which is which is unethical. So I think there's a clear distinction there. 
yeah yeah i agree with that okay yeah. now can i just can i ask you i mean it's, it's you don't have to you can tell me as much as you like but you said you've been going to church so i'm really interested in that you know given that i'm a vicar um can you can you tell me anything about it um what can i tell you so again we're straying quite a long way from book territory here because i want people to think through your mind is about laura's experience of religion i mean i've been to church at different phases of my life i went to a C of E school mm. um how am i finding it i'm not really i haven't really been enjoying some aspects of services i've gone to as a lot of sitting up and standing down and mm. the service is a bit mystifying i'm a little bit too lost in the process and i can't lose myself in it spiritually i feel like i get more myself spiritually from praying quietly on my own okay. um i also don't like the hymns where i've been going don't okay. know any of them they're all dirge like I like nice hymns. Yeah. Um, I think what I want, I think what I'd really want from church is something that feels like the C of E church experiences of my childhood, which seem to be gone. Okay. Which which were, how were they? Nice hymns? Nice hymns. Yeah. The hymns are important to me. I think that um, I like that feeling of the community coming together, singing the same songs. I want to know the tunes. I want to feel like they're pleasurable and nice to sing. I don't want old Victorian words set to music that sounds the same in every single song. Okay. Um, but I've really enjoyed sermons. I really okay. enjoy that. I think that's, for me, that's a nice thing. Every, you know, on, on, and I'm not going every week, it's about once a month, but to have that time that's set aside for listening to someone I consider very wise and interesting in part their their knowledge and their guidance. I really enjoy that. Mm. But for me, there has to be something of a sense of trust um that said I've also had I've had trouble in the past with vicars I maybe don't respect or don't like you know you know you go to a church and it's almost like woke bingo listening to a mm. service and it's yeah. and it's really like oh and it's it's been something for me to um think of the minister as they're in a role for God and not think about whether I like them or respect them, but accept okay. them in that role. Uh, but there's a lot of things I've come come to through going to church in this recent, you know, it, it, experiment would be the wrong word, but resolution in mm. 2023. Um, another positive I've got out of it is really understanding um, the need for forgiveness and, you know, confession in a way, even if it's just privately in my prayers mm. and feeling a lot more acceptance of it's a work in progress constantly trying to work on sin flaws and failings um and that's that's a daily practice for me i i pray every day and i acknowledge acknowledge what i feel i'm doing wrong you know mm. confess privately to god and ask for for help that's that's been a new thing for me that i um yeah it's 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 kind of an integral part of my day now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have no idea what you wanted me to say, Jamie. I no, had no, a <laughs> loose just, collection just... of thoughts. But I've, again, I've got that's to stress great. that's totally out of the remit of the book. But yeah. I think, you know, the thing is, the last several years have been upending for many people. And mm. it does take you to all the really big questions. What does it mean? What's the point of human beings? Is there God? And, you know, whatever you think about religion or faith, one very important thing it imparts on people is to deal with the fear of death, which is it's the steam in our emotional engine you know Seneca said that if you have acknowledged you will die you mm. are not a slave anymore to the politician those aren't the exact words I'm sorry I can't remember them but but yeah. the essence of it is you need to deal with your fear of death in order to live free yeah yeah you, yeah otherwise you would just be apt to be manipulated and what was that there's a there's a good quote actually I think it's in the last uh last chapter where it's, it's not necessarily a quote it's the it's the bit where um Ernest Becker describes, I'm just looking for it. I know exactly where it is. It's here. Oh, yeah. Um, the, so Ernest Becker, who wrote The Denial of Death, you write, this is the driving force behind religions, revolutions and wars. And this is the quote from Be Becker, battles between immortality projects. And I think that's that's interesting, mm -hmm. isn't it? That that he's saying, you know, that that all of these things are ways of just um almost distracting ourselves from the fact that we're we're mortal and that we're going to die so that we we don't think we we don't think about it but again it kind of goes back to that question of well does that necessarily mean then that every single um every single uh 
answer one might find for dealing with the fear of death fear of death is necessarily illegitimate or could there actually be a, an actual answer to the to the problem which is well i think you, you i mean I, I, there isn't there isn't one answer to that you probably feel like you've got the one answer to it but i don't think there's there's one answer but i mean i i Be- becker's really interesting isn't he um mm. Yeah, I think I think you can see it in in some current news topics and themes. You know, our our fear of what we're doing to the climate is like a kind of a reverse Garden of Eden story. We 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 see ourselves as omnipotent and all powerful and able to completely destroy creation because we don't see it as being created. I think a lot of um, what's at the heart of transgender ideology is really about seeking the ultimate transpersonal relationship, but with yourself. Mm. Um, I think a lot of these movements couldn't happen unless we were in a post-religious, post-modern time of spiritual and intellectual chaos, actually. Um, AI, you know, a lot of the fear about AI, people think it's going to be a god. I mean, Yuval Noah Harari said that AI could even write a Bible Mm. and he's trying to scare people. Well, if it writes a Bible, it'll be because someone's told it to write a Bible. It's the Mm. person you need to worry about, not the AI. And so far, all it's done is show the Pope in a white puffer jacket. Mm. But there's a a real crisis of confidence, which I think is symptomatic of being in a post-religious time. Yeah, it's it's a desire on the part of humanity and I think specifically post-Christian society to transcend the limitations of being a human being. I mean, the, the transgenderism thing is so, is so clearly linked to transhumanism in that in that mm. sense. And um, I think uh, Mary Harrington did a really good job of talking about that in her book, Progress Against Feminism, which she talks about meat meet lego gnosticism i think i think that's that's absolutely true it's about pushing beyond the boundaries even of biological sex and then humanity itself it's a religious it's a religious answer you can't get you can't get away you can't get away from religion and you can't get away from christianity i mean that's um that's the that's the problem that we i mean it's i don't know whether it's a problem but i just think it's it's so manifestly clear like when you open your eyes and see that these are these are religious or at least quasi religious um themes that keep coming up and again and again the climate change thing is the apocalypse you know it's the it's the it's the it's the fiery furnace it's just imminent rather than eschatological it's just happening right now instead oh it's of- fire and brimstone it's yeah. fire brimstone it's 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 end of days apocalyptic fears yeah yeah that's absolutely right so um yeah but, no. but, I, but what worries me is hearing world leaders talk about it in those terms and if and if the actual apocalypse doesn't come in the next year I think, well what are they going to do to deliver it how are they going to double down on this yeah <laughs> that's that's what worries me is they're overstated overstated publicly overstated fears and yes. demand for a certain sort of ritualized subservience to the climate uh climate gods from all of us that worries me it's, I, it's yeah it's not the climate that worries me it's what they're saying about it yeah absolutely and I guess what I was trying to sort of get, <laughs> maybe this sort of speaks to my insecurity, but I think one of the things I was thinking when I was reading the book is, you know, do Laura and Patrick think that people like me are are necessarily agents of manipulation and um, propaganda? So what, what do you think to that? No, no more than anyone is. Everybody is an agent of manipulation, propaganda. Like I said, you know, it's in our language all the time. Every time we speak, we're exerting some form of influence on the person we're talking to. And if you're trying to do good, you will be trying to influence people towards your point of view. Mm. I hope it doesn't come across because the church is included in the book that we see vicars as agents of manipulation Mm. um i don't think that about christianity or any religion um i think one thing i'm left with at the end of writing the book is actually a lot more humility about other people's point of view as well um i feel my own guardrails which is I, i know what it means for me to be good and to have faith and believe in something divine that's bigger than the rest of us. And I mm. let go of the fear of death a very long time ago. I'm not really very frightened of it. Perhaps that's why I've got the confidence to um, say the things I do publicly. Yeah. Perhaps I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a slave to politicians because you can't frighten me with that ultimate taunt. It's not that I thought anyone was ever going to come for me and threaten my life. But, you know, it's very freeing. It is yeah. very freeing to have faith. Yeah. Um, so I, I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't think of of you that way. I would think of barely anybody that way, except the nudges. They're agents of manipulation. Right. That's interesting. Is there is there think, is there a danger to being too open? Yeah, you. I mean, you can be so open, your brains fall out. But I think I'd be more worried about some of the lefty academics in that sense than me. <laughs> yeah, that's the Orwell quote, isn't it? Yeah, is is that Orwell who said the thing about you can be so open minded, your brains fall out? I thought that was G.K. Chesterton, but you you may be right about that. Oh no, no, you could be, you could be. Gosh, I'm so sorry. Maybe you're right. Let's right. let's. Why do we finish with you being right, right about a quote? <laughs> well, I may be wrong. I may be wrong. Laura. Let's finish with the ambiguity. But uh, yeah, it's almost almost a couple of hours. So I think even it's probably, better. It's probably, it's probably enough. Um, but yeah, so free your mind. So it's out. It's out now, right? And hardback. It is. Yeah. Oh. Oh. In fact, it's it's landed in the Sunday Times bestseller list in its wow. first week. Wow. So um, that means lots of people are buying it, which okay. means that everyone else who's listening should buy it because that you know with the with the social proof principle, we all like to do the things that other people are doing. Wow. Eight out of ten cats prefer whiskers. You see, ninety nine mm. billion Burger King burgers sold. Yes. Um, so it's only it's on the Sunday Times bestseller list, which means that anyone who's listening should rush out and buy it. Yeah, because everyone will have read it and they won't have read it and they won't know what's going on and they'll be left out. Yeah. So, and absolutely. then by the time they've read it, they'll understand the social proof principle and it would never make them buy it again. Yeah, exactly. How ironic. Well, <laughs> there you go. All right, Laura. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for, for the interview. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for asking me completely different questions to anyone else. <laughs> I thought if anyone was going to ask me if I'm going to church and believe in God, it would be you. Yeah. And it was, a, it was a really interesting chat. I, I love coming on the Irreverent Podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs>